Hello friend, that's me, Bongo, and that's Sam. We've been making a big CNC machine and this video is about the part I'm riding on, the unique and peculiar gantry. Let's look at how it was made, how it performs, and in the process see if we can't get some design principles that will be useful beyond CNC machine making. Way back, before video cameras were invented, when I first proposed using this material to make a gantry beam on a CNC forum, the response was universal. Don't do it, it's a terrible idea. Most of the reasonable objections had to do with this profile. The extrusion was long enough that I could cut it in half and double up, but it wasn't clear how the parts would join together or how the linear rails would fit onto such a structure. There was plenty of umming and ahhing and awful ideas about how this might happen bandied around, and the consensus on the forum was nicely summarised by a camera. Well, common sense said I gave it up. So it was with the potential wrath of an angry mob of CNC super nerds hanging over me that I cut out these pieces. Then came the army of dead hard disk drives that were butchered with as much accuracy as my fairly feeble mill could muster, and made into a uniform set of spacers. With every passing hour I spent working on this, I felt those dastardly helpful forum goers who had actual CNC building experience coming closer and closer to being completely right. We had a pile of parts which, nice as they were, didn't really resemble a functioning gantry. There was one trick up the sleeve, and it wasn't just a long wire brush. No, because hidden amongst a shit ton of other good information in Dr. Bamberg's PhD thesis are the concepts of replication and damping. You see, it was gaps. That was always going to be the problem with my reclaimed hodgepodge of parts. Barring a miracle of machining, I was never getting joints like these as strong as they needed to be. Here's the idea with replication though. You align your parts perfectly using set screws or jigs, roughen up one mating surface, wax the other, then squeeze or inject high strength metallized epoxy between the two so that it fills up all the gaps. When it's cured, it should be bonded firmly to the roughened surface and should release from and have replicated exactly the waxed surface. What we've been doing thus far isn't exactly replication as we've been bonding permanently the surfaces and infilling with epoxy granite. It is fantastic at vibration damping. Let's talk about how the end plates are made. Not only uh, attach the gantry to the linear rails and the ball screw, but they also provide a vital part of tying this together and bracing the whole structure and preventing twist and the like. The plates were quite big and ambitious castings, but that in no way diminishes the impressive variety of ways I bungled these things up. I mean, I really did everything wrong from the way I prepared the green sand to the flasks I was using, how I poured it in, the technique, the temperature I melted out the furnace, the list is endless. And you can probably see there's a visible bow that way. This edge is a complete mess. So after successfully identifying most of the ways I could demonstrate incompetence on the green sand method, I actually switched to trying a lost foam method. In my head, it meant I wouldn't need to mix green sand again, which I was quite sick of by that point. Of course, eventually I ended up making a green sand mixer or mulling machine, which you can see a series of videos on. The excitement in trying to make these two foam patterns was in the knowledge that this was a one-shot deal. The foam will be instantly vaporised when the molten aluminium comes near it. That and of course not really knowing what I was doing, and again I exhibit all kinds of mistakes here. If you want an example of actual good sand casting and the benefit of all the mistakes I've made, then you can check out this video here. Cutting up the fails so they fit in the crucible for remelt is probably fun and demoralizing in equal measure. Mm. 
this one poured slower and had better venting didn't form the same these same kind of ripples i should say that it's not at all typical to use castings in home built cnc machines normally people buy rather expensive pre-machined flat plates of aluminium and bolt them together to make the shapes they want if I was to do over, I would do casting again just because of the flexibility it gives you in terms of the geometry. And now I have a much better idea of what I'm doing. I imagine the process going much smoother. Here's where the process of replication with the metalized epoxy really comes into its own. I would have had to spend a very long time machining the surfaces of those plates flat. But instead, I can just use this epoxy putty it's going to stick to the end of the gantry that I roughened up and it will conform and match exactly to the inside of the gantry plates. Let's see how this went. In an ideal case, this leaves you with a joint that has better surface contact than if it was a ground finish on both sides. So you can see some of it stuck in around this corner here. The linear rails mount to a surface that's fine sand epoxy sandwiched between aluminium extrusion and steel. Not the easiest to drill and tap, but I'm very excited about how dead it sounds when I hit it with a hammer. Again, we're using the process of replication, this time with an engineer's straight edge to get a completely flat surface for the linear rails. The metalized epoxy is approximately 0.5 millimeters at its deepest. As well as being a dead flat surface, it should also give some constrained layer damping action once the steel linear rail is bolted to it. I've been pondering how to fix the nut here onto the plate that's gonna slide across. In this instance, it's the screw that's gonna be spinning round and the nut's gonna stay rigid. Now I even went to the extent of making a, something out of a bit of solid aluminium that I cast in a bean can uh, until I decided that wasn't going to work that well because I want a way to cover up this when it's in use. That led me to these scraps here that I've just spent an excessive amount of time prepping on the lathe. I weld them up and we'll see if this crazy scheme will work. I actually need to be really quite precise with this part. The front face here, the internal bore, and possibly this top part, although I might do the epoxy trick on that, all need to be very precise. Oh, what a fit. Zero discernible play. That's before it's bolted on there. Now the Y-axis ball screw. It came from the factory with no machining on one end. I'm a little bit nervous about doing this on the lathe. We'll see how it goes. We'll probably have to use the angle grinder on the very outer layer before we can then turn it more traditionally. Any particles of grinding dust or anything like that going in the bore screw is a terrible idea. It's gonna to need to be exactly concentric with the shaft of the bore screw. Any deviation there will mean wibble wabbleage. This must have been a very well hardened bore screw because even once I've taken the surface layer off, the inside was still not playing ball with my carbide tooling. Just like the linear rails you saw me cutting earlier, this wasn't perfectly sized for the machine I'm building, 
but it was a heck of a discounted price on eBay. In those circumstances, for the hobbyist cnc -er, it's probably worth the extra fiddle-faddle to make it work, even if it means slight redesigns of your machine. Ball screws this sort of size tend to be attached by one bearing at one end and two angular contact bearings opposing each other the other end. That's called the fixed end because it can't move axially. This piece that I'm roughing up real good is going to be the fixed end bearing housing and the servo mount. Mostly that's getting the epoxy replication treatment, but this particular face I've milled and I'm now getting it as flat as possible. It will act as a useful reference surface that I can indicate against as I bond this into the gantry. When I use a relatively stiff epoxy putty like this, I always like to put on an initial bonding coat of very concentrated epoxy with a little bit of sand. And I really scrub that into the surface to make sure it bonds well. A slow hardener is certainly the way to go with assemblies like this where you're adjusting jack screws and measuring and readjusting and measuring again. It often takes a lot longer than you expect, especially in cases like this where it actually needs to be perfectly perpendicular in two axes rather than one. Adjusting it in one axis often tweaks it off in the other and you kind of have to go back and forth chasing for it until you reach some kind of accuracy, exasperation, equilibrium. The preload of the angular contact bearings is adjusted by this lock nut. I'm not fully sure on the sort of precise way of doing this. I just did it by hand so that it didn't feel stiff but neither had any play. This is how it goes together down at the fixed end. The black bearing block which came with the ground ball screw is spaced out with that aluminium spacer and then goes onto this front plate which is what attaches to the servo mount thing that I just bonded into the y-axis. I'm using an off-the-shelf HTD drive pulley that seemed to have a lot of excess material, hence the cutting down on rotating mass a little bit there. It's getting two grub screws and Loctite, so fingers crossed it stays in place nicely. There's flats filed on the shaft where the grub screws go, so I might get it off again. Relative to that, the floating end simple, it's just bean can aluminium turned up used as a mount and epoxied onto the gantry end plate. The only difficulty is in putting it in just the right place so the screw is accurately lined up with the linear rails. Between the two ends of this ball screw, marking up, drilling holes, measuring, remarking, epoxying, I've probably had this thing on and off like a thousand times. Well, at least four anyway. Just the disembodied y axis at the moment. Uh, I managed to crash it already down that end very slowly, though, luckily. But that's why I've now got limit switches in place for my complete novice experimentation with the G code. The next big milestone we're going to try and put the gantry on the frame. We'll use metallized epoxy to make a really great joint between the bottom of the gantry and these sliding cars. And in the process, we need to square the gantry to the rails, level it nicely and square it sort of that way as well. Let's see how it goes. So much prep work went into getting to this point from the leveling the frame rails to making the whole gantry that I must admit I was quite nervous. With the ability to adjust the gantry in all orientations with the jack screws though there probably wasn't really any need to be. 
So yeah, the nerves faded on the accuracy, exacerbation, equilibrium roundabout. <laughs> oh, that feels good. It's such a, a dead kind of dampened movement action. Quite hard to describe. I don't know how much force I'm likely to be putting through this gantry when I'm milling aluminium or wood. Probably when I'm milling aluminium, I'll do it closer to the edges or even the back corner where it's slightly more rigid. Oh my good gracious, did you see that? Absolutely clean as a whistle. Basically reflecting my disgusting grubby hands. Well, even though these chips feel like celebratory fireworks, they are going everywhere and I totally need to work out a better way of sealing these ball screws back here, or a way. That is a way bigger cut and a way better finish than I've ever achieved on the mill. It's got me super curious. And there, okay. How will the deflection compare with a force of say 75 kilograms? Okay, that's about 20 microns. Now for the ultimate test, the bouncing. I'm making that roughly 35 microns. Let's compare to the milling machine. The head's roughly halfway up the column. That's super easy. Okay. That's super easy. Okay. 130 microns. That is interesting. I didn't try the bouncing. Would you like more details on this CNC machine build? The epoxy granite recipe, for example, the pitch of the ball screw, the type of spindle, the visual basic code to change the spindle tooling, the end mills we use and where we get them from, all those kind of granular details. Check out the video description below. Would you get a kick out of playing around with the CAD model for this CNC machine? If so, again, video description below. Check out our other channel, Flowering Elbow for Super Nerds. There's a bunch of shorter videos on the CNC machine. Look at that. That's just a silky smooth sliver. Okay, friend, I salute you. Peace and love. See you next time.